I was listening to what Mark said at the end of the morning session about uh, you know, a, a very select few of us being able to do something that we're passionate about. Uh, and I feel really lucky being one of those people. And I have every reason to be excited um, because this month, and sort of coinciding coincidentally with this event, uh, we're opening something that I've personally been working on for 11 years. Um, it's a project in lower Manhattan. It's called Fulton Center. Uh, it's a subway station I'll tell you a little bit about. Uh, I suspect a large number of you probably used it today uh, in order to get to the, the TED conference. And um, I think it's safe to say that a lot of what we've done here we could not have done without digital technology. So I'm going to try to make a, a plea as to why these digital technologies are really transforming the way that we design the environments that we occupy. So uh, just to, to start off, um, the subway system, most of us are familiar with it one way or another. It's been around for over 100 years. And when it started off, it had sort of an inextricable, inextricable link to the, the sky and to natural light, because electric light bulbs weren't around yet, or they weren't proliferate yet. So the, the stations were always oriented in such a way that natural light could be brought down, either through skylights in the medians or through lenses in the sidewalks. There was always some way of getting natural light down there. And as soon as we started to get a lot of electric light bulbs, that started to change very dramatically. Stations were pushed down. They were no longer coincided with the streets. We used the electric light bulb. And this painting from George Tooker, which is up in the Whitney, actually does a really great job of capturing people's sense of sort of disorientation and alienation that was felt in the subway system after these changes had been made. Now, um, we were commissioned. Uh, we, uh, as, as they said, um, I work for a company called Arup, which is an engineering firm. And we were commissioned by the MTA uh, 11 years ago to design a transit center that would link 11 subway lines downtown. And we wanted to take this idea of reconnecting natural light back down to the subway system. Um, through the design process over the last 10, 11 years, we've partnered with Grimshaw Architects, who is the architect of record for this space, and an artist, James Carpenter Design Associates, who came in to assist us with a certain element. And the project is far too vast to describe in the time that I have. So I'm going to bring it down to one very, very specific point and concept that was there at the very beginning. This image was, uh, it was presented in the, for the American Institute of Architects in a presentation in 2003. And it defined a concept, that concept of, of bringing natural light back down into the subway system. And it's an objective. It's a very high-level mission that's, that's encapsulated in this, this slide. But it doesn't give you any sort of information about how that's going to be achieved. It was only through a collaboration of the design team, the engineer, the artist, the architect, where the very materials the finishes, the dimensions that were necessary in order to realize this could be encapsulated into the space. And the end result ultimately looks a bit like this. Now, the, the space itself is a very grand space that's modeled after the Pantheon. Uh, the idea that there's a large dome with a, a, an oculus at the top, a circular skylight that brings light in and, and channels it down into the space below. But it doesn't just perform. It's also an art piece. And the artist on board made sure of that. But what we needed to do was, as a, as, a, as a design team, come up with a way that this thing could be an art installation, but also perform in an architectural and technical way. You know, just some details about this installation that's there. Um, it goes by the moniker Sky Reflector Net. It's a genuine piece of art. It is also architecture and it's engineering, and it performs some very, very specific functions for the building. Um, the, the, the installation itself is a cable net, which means that it is a set of tensile cables that run from the large oculus at the top of the building, which is that sort of large tennis racket, all the way down to the second and third floors below. There's, um, it's about eight stories tall. There's um, 112 cable pairs that come down, crisscrossing each other. And inside each of those holes of the net, we've put a reflected aluminum panel, which we call an optical aluminum panel. And those panels sort of sit there, and they reflect the light down in a very specific way that I'll discuss. But what was most important about all of this was that the, the net itself be an artistic installation, that it be the element that channels the light down. The panels themselves were a critical part of that. But because there were nearly 1,000 of them, they all needed to be very light. Otherwise, the cables would be very large. The hardware would be very, hard, very large. So we needed to keep everything light. We put all those panels in there. And we needed to find a way to do the design. And the digital technologies, some of which that we're displaying out in the, uh, in, in the, in the lobby outside here, um, they go a long way to talk about a number of ways we do it. I'm going to talk about two specific ways. The first one, obviously, this is focal to the aspect of light. 
And so our, our engineers at the very beginning started to bring the design team into the thoughts about how natural light passing into the space of the Oculus would hit a, a space inside without any kind of installation. So what you see here is a, an initial rendering of Fulton Center with no cable net inside. And we can see how the light at different times of the year, at different times of the day, come through the space, and they illuminate the walls in different ways. Now, that's all well and good, but now we need to find a way to bring the installation in. So around 2007, 2008, we started to get our hands on digital technologies that would allow us to not only show where the light would hit, but how it would reflect off of different materials inside of the space. So working with the architects, the engineers, and the artists, we came up with a geometry for this net, which you saw before, and we were able to start to look at the different things that the panels themselves could be made out of, the different finishes, the different materials, and how those materials would take the light that came into the space and bring it down and reflect it into the space below. And this was really important, and it kind of goes a little bit against um, what some of the other speakers have talked about, about how cycling through various different types of technologies, listening to different, uh, different instances of the same sampled music, can sometimes have a detrimental effect, or it can sometimes depreciate the overall point of it in the first place. But here, of course, we only have one opportunity to be able to build this sky reflector net, this cable net. We have to get the finishes right. We have to get the dimensions right. And in order to do that, we need to get the entire design team. We need to get them into a space where we can actually show them what these different materials, these different finishes, are going to do to the quality of the light inside. So this, for example, is a, a, a digital rendering inside the space from below looking up at the Oculus. And you can see the net around it. And what we've done here is we've actually done some color contouring so we can see that the way the light hits the net and intentionally explodes into the space below. And this is just a hypothetical scenario with one type of finish that's projected onto the, uh, that's used for the, the panels. And looking below it, here is the space below the entire net which people would occupy. And you can see this is, this is a rendering, but more so than most renderings that we see, this particular piece of software works very hard to figure out exactly how much light is going to hit each of the surfaces. And it takes into account all the different types of finishes, the reflectivity, the smoothness of the surfaces, so we can see how light can bounce off of different surfaces and illuminate others. So we have the net above us, we have the space below, and we can see the different surfaces that are there. With the entire design team with us, we were able to cycle through these different um, materials. Here we see um, a fully reflective surface. So if we were to made it, make the cable net panels out of a perfectly mirrored surface, um, we would see that it would reflect off of that. The light would come down, and we see the surfaces below the net being very, very lit and illuminated. If we use something that was just painted white, the whole net would explode with light. It would be very bright, but the area below it would not be very bright because there would be very little light reflecting off of it. So using these different technologies, we were able to come up with a way to uh, work with the artists and the architects to establish just the right kind of finish that would reflect the light off of the net in such a way that the panels themselves would be lit. The light would illuminate the net, but the light as it came down into the space would make it all the way down into the subway system below. And uh, this represents the final solution, which is sort of an intermediary area where we were able to sort of quantify the amount of reflectance that the type of material would have. And then working with beside the artist, who was able to look at the different types of materials that have this kind of reflectance, he was able to narrow down the different materials that would achieve, from a performative standpoint, bringing the light down into the space, but would also achieve the overall end objective of, of having some sort of dynamic interplay with the sky. My presentation I, I put on the front is to fold the sky into a building. And that was something that was sort of qualitatively added by the artist at the beginning once the artist came on board. And so we wanted to achieve that. And as, as this allowed us to do, we could narrow down the finishes so that he could find the ones that had the artistic effects he looked for. So from a lighting perspective, these digital technologies allowed us to get into a space where we could build any number of these sky reflector nets with different finishes, different reflectivities, different dimensions, and look at how it reflected the light. And the ones we didn't like, we were able to cast aside. And that's kind of an interesting aspect, because from a, a design standpoint with our buildings, we spent centuries through the Middle Ages, through the Gothic period, doing trial and error, 
if, if a certain type of building system didn't work and it fall, fell down, we would do it a different way. If it didn't fall down, we would do it again. And it was around the 17th or 18th century that we got to the point where we were being predictive. We realized that we could, in most cases, only build something once. We no longer could afford to have things fall down on us. So we created this sort of predictive model. And with technology, what it's allowed us to do is have a harmony between both, where we have the ability to be able to predict, but at the same time, there's no more consequence. There's no waste in, in designing something and not liking it and throwing it away, because it's all virtual and digital. And that's exactly what we did with Annette here. Now, while we were playing around with these aspects of light, as I mentioned, it, it has a large number of other performative aspects to it, and one of which is, is behind that net. It, it's, it's effectively a shroud to a large number of building systems duct work, diffusers, intakes, these things that allow the space to be comfortable, to be occupiable, and in the event of an emergency is able to pull out a large amount of smoke. This is a photograph inside the, the, the dome where we've got sort of, you can see the oculus up at the top. This is before the panels were installed in the net. You can see right behind it this large duct, and sometimes photographs and scale can betray it, but this duct is so big that someone could actually walk full standing up through it. It pulls in a huge amount of air when it's turned on, and you can see the intakes pull it right through the net. And of course, the net is it's just made out of cables. The net itself is a very soft form. It's sort of like these caterpillar sculpture things that we have up here, where you can kind of see that even in an indoor environment that is completely artificial, we have wind, we have airflow. And, and these, these tensile forms that are basically membranes, will, they'll expand, they'll contract, they'll move. And in this space, we have any number of different effects that cause that to happen. We've got the airflow from that duct. And when, that, when the ducts turn on, then the net will want to breathe. It'll want to grow and shrink like a lung. Also, the fact that this thing captures so much light means that the steel in the system itself will heat up to very high degrees. And that, of course, changes its shape as well. So the indoor environment, despite the fact that it's protected from wind by the, the outside skin of the building, it has so many different environmental effects that cause so many different types of forces on the net that we needed to make sure that this soft form would be able to accommodate that. And that caused a bit of a crisis in our, in our design process because the net, which we understood was going to be soft, and we understood that if we were to put a different type of force on it, it's going to change shape. That's what nets do. But the panels themselves, I said before, had to be very light. They had to be very delicate because we had 1,000 of them, and we had to hold them all up with this system. So the delicate panels had to be held up by this net that wants to move. The panels are made out of this rigid aluminum, and if you put any kind of force in them, they have a tendency to break. So this, this is intended to show that, that the net itself grows, and as it grows, those holes that support the, the panels inside them will change shape. And if the panels are held rigidly and the force is transferred into them, those panels will break. And of course, then we have a bunch of broken panels on our hands. And any New Yorker in the room can probably tell you that this project already has enough catchy New York Post headlines to it. So it was sort of a personal mission of ours to avoid one more of those. So we needed a solution to all of this. And once again, we went back to digital technologies to try to figure out how to quantify these effects, how to try to make this soft, soft system work coherently with this very rigid panel system that was inside of it. And the first thing we did was we tried to quantify that airflow, the movement and the forces that were on it. Typically, in conventional terms, we'd be very conservative. We'd throw a very conservative number, and we would just design for it. But now that we have all these computational methods at our disposal, we can do things like simulate the flow of all of the air inside the space. When it comes out of the diffusers in the floor, passes through the space, and is pulled out, we can simulate that in the computer. And what this has done is this actually shows you a map of the air which is flowing in at the bottom at a very high rate comes up through the atrium, goes through the cable net, which you can see on the two, two, two edges there, and then comes into this diffuser again at a very high rate. And we can see how those forces affect the overall net and go on it. And then what we were able to do is quantify the changes in shape. So this is a developed elevation of that net, the cable net that's up there. When the wind, when the air pressure changes in the space, when those diffusers come on, or when the sun comes through the oculus and heats up parts of the, the, the net, it's going to change shape. And this is a developed map showing each one of those holes and the changes in the shape of each of those holes and quantifying the movements and the changes in those spaces. So we needed an answer. We needed an understanding of, of what the numbers were in this crisis in order to come up with a solution to it. The problem we had is the more analysis that we did, the more scenarios we found that would cause it to change shape. 
different movements in the building, these air flows, the different changes in temperature, the contractor putting in a different level of tension in the net. All of this was cause, causing a compounding problem where all of a sudden we found ourselves with 815 different probable scenarios. And each one of these probable scenarios has 1,000 nodes in it that's connected to four panels on each side. It's a tremendous amount of data to process. So we started to create scripted algorithms that were able to simulate this entire process, figure out what the environment is, look at how it changes the shape of the net, look at how those changes in the shape of the net, we're going to change the panels and try to quantify that. And after looking at all of these different scenarios, looking at all of the different connections through all of these different scenarios, we were able to quantify the worst case scenario throughout the entire system under any conceivable circumstance. And Lo and behold, that answer was that the largest movement was going to be on the order of about of a quarter of an inch. And a quarter of an inch isn't on its own very impressive. But considering the fact that it would only take movements on the order of about 1 32nd of an inch to cause a complete failure in some of these panels, we needed a solution. We needed to come up with a way to handle that. So what we did was we came up with this way of attaching the panels to the net. It's a cruciform connector that allows us to have movement built into oversized holes on the sides. The top and the bottom create restraints so that the panels are held just where they need to be in those holes, no matter what their orientation in space. But as the net grows and shrinks, the movement is accommodated by these connectors. And that was something that we could only get to by fully understanding exactly what those movements were and coming up with a connector that had exactly the right amount of allowance in it for the worst case movement. And the beauty of all of this was, by running through all these hypothetical scenarios, we were able to look at all of the different possibilities, all of the different effects in the net, and we were able to come up with a solution to the connector, which allowed us to build one connector that would work in all 1,000 places. And we once again used the scenario building, the parametric modeling, the power of the digital technologies to be able to do that. And this is a shot of, of, of the, the, final, the, the near final configuration um, when we went to a full-scale mock-up only about three years ago up in Massachusetts. You can see the, the connectors there holding it in place. And I, I had the ability the, to, to travel up there with the, the artist and the architect to see it. And I have to say, after working on it for 10 years, nine years, when we finally got up there, seeing it in real, real time, was, it was transcendent. It was amazing to see it. But it was transcendent to everyone who was there and, and for a different reason. To me, it was transcendent because I knew how important it was that this net have a harmony in the way that the panels sit within the net. And by grabbing on it, by shaking it, I convinced myself that that actually can happen. For the artist and the architect, they were really interested in that first part, the light, and how that affected it. And they were blown away. It was transcendent to them with the way that the finishes on the material were able to take the light and bring it down to below the, the net in such a transcendent way. So looking on the other side, one side it looks almost transparent. You can see right through it. But once the reflectance comes on on the other side, it starts to show that effect of bringing the light down. Um, and it has such an amazing effect on it. And then the end result is here. And once it was on in, it put in place and tension and the panels were in, again, it was just amazingly transcendent. And, and what's amazing about the end result is, is that remember I showed that sketch was the idea to br simply bring light in. But you know, I'm an engineer, and what I want more than anything else is a way to define every aspect of what it is. So qualitatively saying we're going to fold the sky into a building isn't enough. We need to figure out what dimensions, what finishes, what's going to do that, how is it going to do that. And it was the collaboration that we had between the artist, architect, and engineer, and then the simulating that we were able to do inside, the, inside of our computers to be able to figure out what materials had what effect on the lighting effects that we were able to come to an end result. And the end result is amazing. It's amazing to me because the dy dynamism is there in the fact that this is a constantly moving form. And the fact that every minute of every day, the lighting changes. And this shot here, which is probably my absolute favorite, is one that I've just, as much as I've tried to replicate, I can't. And it's, it's amazing to me because it's, it's that moment, and you probably, it's like a magical moment in Manhattan where just before the sun drops on the sort of over the Hudson, and you have the last explosion of light during the day, and it hits like the Empire State Building, and the little metal pinstripes in the Empire State Building sort of explode for that one moment. With the sky reflector net, at that very moment, all those illuminated buildings kind of fold into the space like an apparition. And even though within the space you have no hope of actually being able to see the buildings around you, they suddenly are there for that one moment. And it folds the sky in, and it folds the city in, and it's just an amazing space to be. And the reason that it can be this way was because we were able to take hundreds of different scenarios, hundreds of different virtual ideas, and scrap all but one of them, and come up with the one that we felt met that objective at first, 
and then quantify what the dimensions, the finishes, the materials were, and then use those to build something that achieved what we wanted it to.